Jeff? Where would you invest $50 million? I'd take my 50 and do it. <laughs> no. That was not part of the report. That, that doesn't, that's not allowed, no. These large data centers being planned near the Permian Basin, a lot of natural gas yeah. production. What do you think about that phenomenon? People are realizing that the time to power equals to the time to revenue. And if you turn to any one of these customers and, and to any of the Magnificent Seven, and you can tell them, I can get you online, i.e. making money in 90 days, that is a far cry from the 48 months they're looking at now. Yeah. Okay. The holy grail of the data center world, in my language, is that your request on the data and the action taken on that data occur in the same space, mm -hmm. same, same location. Right now, you type in what you need in your phone, it goes to your cell tower, hits to the bottom of the cell tower, hits the fiber. It, it might go 10 miles, it might go 750 miles um, to where that data is processed and then back, okay? That was one of the things where we went, we said, ah, we've got two threads here. We've got the owner, we know what their vested interest is. We also know what our motivation is. If we combine the two, we actually created a unique mechanism where the landlords could co-invest in the data center they could own an economic interest in the, in the data center that was on their site, would minimize the amount of capital we need to raise on our own cap table, while still giving us the capital we needed to build a data center. And by the way, we've got a partner with a very, very vested interest now in helping us to be successful on site. Some of our viewers are investors, some of our viewers are operators that are looking for the next business opportunity to start. We're curious to learn are what are some of the peripheral opportunities that are going to come about this evolution of the data center as a class. AI is reshaping the world and powering it all requires a new generation of data centers. In our next episode, we're joined by two pioneers, Jeff Noland and Hugh Karspecken who built and scaled a successful data center business, taking it all the way to a high-stakes private equity exit. Now, as managing directors at Ubiquity, they're leading the charge in national digital infrastructure. Jeff and Hugh will pull back the curtain on what it takes to scale in this booming industry, share their secrets on securing capital, and tackle the big operational challenges in ensuring reliability and innovation. Plus, they'll reveal the huge opportunities waiting in this thriving ecosystem. Get ready for an eye-opening look into the future of data centers. Because of Simon and Haynes and Boone, we're able to have this event here. So if we could please give another round of applause for them. So um, I'll, I'll dive right into the topic um, of discussion today. So, uh, you know, the, the title for the talk today is um, Unlock the uh, Future of Data Centers. Um, anybody here that didn't hear about data centers or not know what data centers is, raise hand. Zero. Who, who heard about data centers? Mm -hmm. Everybody, 100%. Um, so obviously it's a very, um, very hot topic. Um, but we can spend a lot of time talking about data centers and still be lost because it's such a complex space. Um, so the purpose of this talk was to highlight the phenomenon of data centers and bring two experts that have actually been involved in the data center world before the word became a buzz. So a decade ago, these two gentlemen here co-founded a firm called Dark Points. Uh, they were able to start and scale and exit as successfully to private equity. And most recently, they um, uh, have been working for a large digital infrastructure national player that's playing in that same ecosystem called <laughs> Ubiquity. Um, so uh, today, I wanted to quickly introduce Jeff. Um, we don't have a lot of time to, to talk about all the accolades of Jeff, but. Jeff um, and I actually go way back, 15 years ago, to be exact. Uh, he was uh, my uh, financial modeling and corporate finance teacher for a course I was taking. And, and that's not the only thing he does. That He does that out of you know, joy and passion. Uh, he's uh, been an investment banker, a Wharton, uh, Wharton MBA, um, with, with a real estate investment background for many years. 
and then he got into the data center world. So thank you, Jeff, for uh, doing this today with us. Thank you. And then we have Hugh Karspecken. Hugh and um, Jeff, you guys became friends. Uh, I hear from Dallas, mm -hmm. you guys grew family, and uh, you were starting dark, big dark points at that time, about 12 years ago, mm -hmm. and um, you guys found chemistry with each other, so you were the operator-minded founder who likes to get things done, and you were the strategic finance, the real estate guy. You guys both came together and started dark points. So uh, thank you for joining us. So yeah, just want to start off with, you know, guys, uh, take us back to the journey of dark points and why you guys started it, what it took to scale uh, such a business at that time, and kind of walk us through like the exit as well, maybe. And then you can talk about the finance side, you can talk about the operations side, is that okay? Absolutely, it's great. You want to start? I'll talk about kind of what dark points was at yeah, that Absolutely. So um, dark points... Um, had its uh, genesis with the idea of compartmentalizing data in a much smaller form factor and taking advantage of existing commercial real estate and power distribution uh, to place those assets there closer to the end users. Um, this was ahead of its time, way ahead of its time. Uh, data centers were fairly new on this scene. Uh, data centers have actually been around for about 40 or 50 years uh, in some different form or uh, size function. Um, and here we were taking it from the centralized model into closer and closer to the user, okay? Uh, and at a very high level point, creating data centers is just nothing but enhancing the real estate with air conditioning and power and fiber to allow these computer systems to exist, to talk to each other, and also to go through their modeling and send out the results. Um, it start, started very basic. Uh, with you know, storage devices and internal compute, and now we're starting to turn into, as we've kind of joked about, AI is now coming out where now these applications can go out and exist for a short period of time, uh, deliver what it needs to deliver, uh, and then it can go elsewhere. So it's becoming quite dynamic. So Dark Points was created to provide that platform for that, that, that dynamics um, of that uh, evolution of data. Yeah, yeah it was... Um, uh, it's now a brave new world, obviously. Uh, changed a lot since we got into it. Um, but he mentioned real estate. I think one of the one of the key things with dark points is you know, we realized early on that to build small, there's a well, first of all, there's a big reason why data centers build at a very large scale, called economies of scale, right? We were taking it the complete opposite direction. So we had to figure out if we were going to build economically, how can we leverage real estate? How can we take some of the costs out of the model? Um, and you kind of jumped ahead because you you know you mentioned that we got got into real estate and leveraging existing power. But first, when we first started Dark Points, we were just looking at any and all real estate that was available. Yeah, we looked at and we actually designed data centers to go in the back of retail storefronts that might have extra space and extra power. We figured out that that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. We ultimately we figured out a lot of different things that wouldn't work. But ultimately, we figured out that we could build a data center inside a commercial office building. We could leverage a lot of the existing infrastructure that the building already has deployed, like power, like cooling, like connectivity, a lot of fiber might already be in these buildings. And we really figured out through that how to drive the cost out of the data center. We figured out that we could actually achieve economies of scale, albeit at a different level than what the big guys were doing. So we got laughed out of a lot of rooms when we first started talking about what we were doing and why. But ultimately, we figured out a pretty cool way to do it. So, very good point to talk about was the economies of scale. So, rule of thumb of the data center industry is about ten million dollars a megawatt, okay, to construct. And we were able to produce, okay, economies of scale. And that was economies of scale. And even the really good guys might be able to reach, might be able to reach seven million a megawatt on construction. We were hitting numbers like three point five million a megawatt, okay. So yes, on a much smaller form factor, but you were able to, the whole idea was you were deploying less capital, so less risk, yeah. very localized, which now <clears throat> is, is, a, is a very popular term now, okay? Back then it wasn't, the, people didn't understand why this was localized, um, but able to, to basically hit the, that 
economics that the larger players were not able to meet and still are not able to meet, leveraging already existed, uh, existing infrastructure. Yeah. Is anybody in real estate in here? I, to put it into real estate terms, data centers at that time, and might still be true, might be a little different now, I'm not, I'm not sure. Data centers at that time were building at 2,000 bucks a foot, right? which is really, really dense, really expensive. We figured out a way to get that down to about four or 500 bucks a foot yeah. to translate it into a real, in, in real estate terms. And so there were a lot of different things that we learned along the way, but that was that was a key thing is figuring that out and then also how to work with real estate owners, which we'll talk about at some point as well. Yes. So great. Um, so just to put some more context in data centers and the evolution of it, right? Um, when we used to talk about data centers or large server farms, um, if you like, you think about Langley, Virginia. Right. Northern Virginia area is a concentration of a lot of these giant uh, structures, right? Mm -hmm. So take us back to sort of when you realize that that location uh, where all these data centers are concentrated were no longer sufficient for this upcoming need for data centers. Just kind of help us understand where you guys, dark points at that time, fit into that larger picture of what it was status quo, and then just bring us to the sort of current market dynamics and, and the trends that you're seeing in the data center world, which I'm sure they're really excited to hear about that part of it. So, so there are many, many different components of, of the data world, okay? Um, we were going after a cost reduction model for our customers. So everybody thinks about their data but people don't really think about their data footprint, okay? Everything that's associated with data, okay? So everyone had their little budget cycles um, and, and their, their budget buckets, rather. The, if you've got a data center and you, are, you pay the data center bill, you're also paying a telecom provider to access your data, okay? So it's just not the cost of your data center, it's your cost of your telecom to get there. And the more data you put in that data center, the bigger your pipe needs to be in order to have high performance or higher performance. Um, and we found, okay, that if we provided the data at the location that was optimal for a customer, we were removing, in some cases, a significant telecommunications component out of this, while at the same time enhancing their performance. So we were basically cutting their data footprint budget in half, okay, by removing one bill, even though our pricing for our data center at that space was, in some cases, higher, well higher than the market, okay? Retail data centers have a certain price per kilowatt per month. We were charging well beyond that because that's just what they wanted. It's what the customer would pay. When they finally recognized their data footprint, which we, which we helped walk them through what they do, um, all of a sudden, like for example, lost IT time, okay? The, all these things that actually come into real concrete dollars, um, that all of a sudden you were, you were saving them significant money. This is different than a lot of the data centers in, in the Virginia area that are model processing, okay? And so we foresaw, and we're starting to see it now, that those applications that could start very centralized, because that's how software is designed, okay, was starting to work its way all the way to all of us. Even though we were focused on dark points and enterprise users, we're all the consumers for this, and they're finding that it's a lot more efficient, okay, where they can, they can I'll give you a very quick definition. The holy grail of the data center world, in my language, is that your request on the data and the action taken on that data occur in the same space, same same location. Right now, you type in what you need on your phone, it goes to your cell tower, hits to the bottom of the cell tower, hits the fiber, it, it might go 10 miles, it might go 750 miles um, to where that data is processed and then back, okay? That's not a problem for many apps, for but it is holding back other future apps. Okay, and so the closer and closer you get these to what we call the last mile, which is the last stop before your eyeballs, things become a lot more efficient, your revenue potential goes way up, 
Um, price and its elasticity uh, are significant. Inelastic, very. Any, very inelastic. Um, and so we built this in preparation for the larger data centers recognizing that these customers, you might have, let's say Honda is a great customer. All of a sudden Honda says, you know, I need to actually be in this location. But that data center can't pick up this data center movement, which created the new market of what we call tier two data centers or edge data centers that started moving out of the six primary locations in the United States. That was a big mantra, and sorry to sorry right. just Basically, to add on to that. One, that was a big mantra: is we could build a data center where the customer wanted it to be. That was one of our biggest ahas was with that first customer is figuring out that total cost of ownership savings that they were able to realize by putting the data center in the building. It was actually in our building. We were co-tenants in the same building with them. There were a few floors above us, but by putting it in the building we could deliver tremendous cost savings. We actually beat out one of the national, one of the biggest name brand data centers out there, I won't name the name, but we beat them out because of that cost savings, because of that flexibility that we could provide. And then we could also provide some things that no data center could provide. We provided them redundant power. Yeah. We provided them a redundant <clears throat> power feed. So for whatever reason, power in the building went down, they would be able to live off of our generator which we had deployed in the uh, in the space as well. So we we learned a lot with that first customer. It was um, that was a really telling thing. That really that's that's kind of the first area where we realized we could compete with the big data centers just compete on a different level. Got it. Yeah, so I think it's a great segue to current market trends. Obviously this space has exploded recently. Um, if you can tie that a little bit with uh, focus more from the customer's perspective. Talk, talk to us. You mentioned Honda. You know, what are they using a data center for? Like, what are their needs, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe just paint a picture of, you know, what happens uh, with the relationship of a, of a customer. What are they using these data centers? Why are they relying on these data centers with this new market trend, if you like? Yeah. <clears throat> people, uh, people are using data centers in, in it. Oh wild array of reasons. Um, no one deletes data. Uh, keep that in mind. No one deletes data. Um, and so people run out of space. Okay, yeah. Just like we all buy bigger houses to do better storage and then you realize within a year you've filled up your old house again. Um, data centers are, are, are no different. Uh, another thing is um, it's very difficult to have. So everyone, I use an architecture a good idea on this, which is the data industry used to, the macro industry used to be comprised of 10 sub-industries. Okay, you could imagine a Microsoft over here or an IBM over here or Intel over here. Today, it's well over 100. Okay, so these are, these are industries, okay, where a J.B. Hunt Logistics is now <clears throat> producing its own level of data. Okay, we've heard of IoT. Okay, so now you've got production plants that are producing their data. Okay, some of it's processed on site. Okay, some of it is sent over fiber to a, another location where they've got other servers. Again, these the, these computers require a very specific environment. Okay, the older ones, maybe ten years ago, it wasn't that bad. To put it in perspective. Um, a, a cabinet in a data center, you've seen these in pictures, maybe ran 3,000 watts out of it, maybe 5,000 watts, okay? Google is now trying to do 200,000 watts. Okay, so these are really, these are becoming thermodynamic challenges. Um, and so um, many of these people did not have the environment to place this type of equipment. They didn't have the security, so they used data centers to be able to do this. But the main thing, for data centers is these were nexus for telecom interconnection. So data centers came out of what we call telecom hotels. And that was where all the copper lines used to come in, where all the AT&T, Ma Bell's switching centers were. And then fiber started following those lines, so people started getting connected. And then that, 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 the, the, that equipment became more complex, needed a little bit more power, and all of a sudden fiber showed up, so they brought the fiber in. And those telecom hotels started growing okay, as just basically brain synapses. The data center said, you know what, I'm gonna create a piece of real estate right beside this telecom hotel, or maybe a floor in this telecom hotel, and I'm gonna allow all this high power to come in. I'm gonna allow the big computers that come in on these little dollies to come in. 
um, and, and, and produce whether it's you know a software as a service um, or their internal records. Okay, um, movie houses rendering. I mean, eighty thousand cores plus for a movie to be able to just create these these movies. Um, so there's a lot. There's a lot of storage. Um, there's uh, just uh, I mean, just mapping our satellites. I mean, there's just all these types of applications that require a lot of connectivity and a lot of power to drive the computers that are there. And they never un they never turn off the computers. They just buy more. And when they buy more, they need to find a new location. So what what new trends are you seeing now with the hyperscalers coming to market? How how do you view operations of a hyperscaler data center compared to the dark points of the world? And from a finance perspective, how do you how do you think about uh, financing such a such a large operation? Yeah. At a very high level, everything started very large. Okay, and then. Based on just normal market dynamics, whether the, a lot of land that you found was not quite as big as you needed, you, you built different size data centers. Um, some were, you know, corporate data centers, enterprise data centers that were built very differently than they, than the Googles, the Microsofts, um, that were built for a very different uh, type of, of, of beast. Um, but then naturally, keep in mind that when the internet got started, when it, it got to what we would call it the internet, there were only six locations within the United States. So you can imagine, um, imagine the highway traffic going into those. Six so, locations, six data centers. Six cities? Cities. That had connection points, okay. Dallas, LA, Chicago, New York. Uh, these were just highly congested areas. All the traffic was coming in. They started realizing, you know what? We need to start spreading this out because we get, you know, we're ha you know, why am I having to get routed all the way through here? Mm -hmm. um, and you'd be amazed at how inefficient this traffic was. So by, I gave you the analogy earlier today, you know, there's just not one grocery store in Houston that people go shopping at. There's a convenient grocery store down the street from you. Okay, so the data world is no different. It realized, you know what? If these people like this product, let me push that product closer in. So that, op that opened up opportunities for regional data centers like Darklands, which is a regional data center. What we also call this edge data centers, but it has got many different definitions, but it, just think of it as access. Again, just access, like access to a freeway. Um, and that created different types of data centers. And what's happening now is we're starting to see what we're doing with it at Ubiquity, what Dark One started doing. Uh, prior to selling it, we're making it much, much smaller, closer to where the fiber points are that go straight to your house and the cellular points that go straight to your phone. Also kind of, also power connections. Correct. Yes, because the power, there is an amazing amount of distributed power already. All right, just uh, recently I was talking to um, a, a major cellular provider. They've got what they call central offices throughout the entire country. Within their central offices, they have well over 200 million watts of available power that is completely stranded. Yet people are building 200 megawatt data centers Okay, to do this. Now, granted, these are multiple points and this is a single point, but people are realizing that the time to power equals to the time to revenue. And if you turn to any one of these customers and, and to any of the Magnificent Seven and you can tell them, I can get you online, i.e. making money in 90 days, that is a far cry from the 48 months they're looking at now. Okay, so now, so what they do is you know what, I don't need that 100 megawatts, it's gonna take 40, I, I do, I want it, I'm gonna keep that project, but you know what, I need eight megawatts today. Where can I do that right now? Okay, and that's what certain, the smaller providers are able to step in and do and leverage the existing distribution that's already in place. You mentioned power, you mentioned Virginia earlier, right? It's been kind of the center of the data center universe for a while, Ashburn, yeah. Virginia. Um, it's hard to get power there now. It's not something that data center providers can get at this point. So now they're having to look elsewhere. I've heard they're looking in Montana, Wyoming, at different different places because power is just the long pole in the tent. If you put it into kind of a real estate development standpoint, it's kind of like getting entitlements to do a project in California, right? It's going to take a long time, 
right? It's not going to be, you know, like zoning in Houston is very open, right. very easy to deal with. I did real estate development in California. Project that takes a year here is going to take 10 out in California. We're starting to see the same thing with power in the data center space. That I was makes... just going to say that we are an energy town in Houston, yeah. and everybody wants to know what the intersection between AI and, and uh, energy is going to be. Um, and, uh, you know, you're hearing about um, these large data centers being planned near the Permian Basin, <coughs> not a lot of natural gas yeah. production. What do you think about that phenomenon? Is that is that a very real thing? Is that is there you see a lot of growth in that space? That's something he sees. I mean, I, I think it's a natural thought to go and look what moving closer to the source of power. Just like data centers initially started on you know the source of fiber, where telecom existed. Yeah. You know, moving close to close to power, but there's challenges there as well. Yeah. There, right. So it, it used to be if you had land and you had fiber, you could you could try to talk to somebody about making a data center there, um, again, 20 years ago. It's now, it's nothing but power. Um, now, you still need the land, you still need the, the fiber. But what they're doing now is data centers have grown wise. <clears throat> they're such a, a, a rat race for power that they finally said, you know what? I'm not so awesome that I can just raise my hand and people can bring power to me. I'm actually going to have to lift up my data center and take it to the power. Okay. Where they're <clears throat> able to take processing um, right to the source. So there was a wind farm out in Kansas, Oklahoma, that they advertised, I mean, in the middle of nowhere, and they had 40 megs available. Okay, I mean, literally, you can still see the beaten path to that location, because they're like, we'll do whatever we take, what it takes to get there, to be behind the meter, okay, in that location. Um, you know, the, the data centers will always use uh, the, the low uh, cost per kilowatt hour that's still driving bragging right to these folks. I'm selling data center power in California at 23 cents a kilowatt hour. Think about that. I mean, you hear these four cents, four and a half cents, okay? We paid seven in Dallas. Yeah. We, we thought seven. we were, we thought we had hit a home run there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. But it, it's, it, you mentioned in, uh, in elasticity and pricing, but it's, that, they're paying that because they need to be there, okay? So these data centers are taking this up to the, the power sources um, to see if they can keep those rates low. Um, but keep in mind, there's also data centers that are um, just nothing but processing hubs, okay? They do nothing for the local community, okay? They're just, just massive engine, okay? Um, and then there are data centers actually where your traffic will, will, will go through, okay? And municipalities are starting to understand this. Um, and uh, so there's power. Now, a small thing that will be a driving force that we're seeing in the EU is data jurisdiction. Where data needs to, if it's produced, it needs to stay within the county that it was produced. Really? Okay. Um, we're seeing a lot of this with the police body cameras. Okay. Um, where it needs to stay. The unadulterated <coughs> video needs to stay within that county. Um, and then only the, the parts that need to go out to the courts can go out. But then it just it needs to stay true. And <coughs> with AI and these, these deep fakes that we start seeing, trust me, that raw data is becoming extremely valuable. Jeff, question for you. What kind of financial considerations should you have in financing a large hyperscale data center? You know, I, I think in any data center situation, we saw it at dark points, so and we can talk a little bit about how we how we chose and how we you know, kind of created a unique model to fund dark points. Um, it, it's kind of like, a, as I would say, I like real estate analogies because I've spent so much time in real estate. You've got to really first understand what you are building, who you are building it for, make sure you have the entitlements lined up. Um, at that point, financing can take on all different types of, you know, different flavors. Um, you know, my current role, we're doing a lot of um, project financing, and project financing is something that's highly structured and available in the data center space. It's available in the fiber space as well. Um, it's not... Um, it's got a lot of very rigid boundaries that you have to live within. Um, you've got to hit certain on the, the commercial bank side or even on the private credit side. It's really on, on all sudden, you know, a lot of these ultimately can make their way into an asset backed securitization, right? An ABS type of structure where the assets can then go to support that, you know, kind of a takeout longer term. Um, and what we'll see is, you know, you've got to get a lot of key construction milestones. 
in these facilities, you've got to hit a key, a lot of key revenue and customer milestones. And you're starting at the land level, right? Absolutely, right. right? From a construction standpoint, building it up from there. So there can be a lot of restrictions in there that make it a pretty challenging environment. It's not just going down to a bank, getting a loan, them giving you a check and saying, hey, call me when your data center's done. Right. It's, hey, we've got regular milestones that we need to meet, a lot of check-ins that need to happen along the way. Um, to get the asset to you know the place where it needs to be ultimately to support an ABS type of structure. So, and I'm sure you're not just dealing with one uh, lender or investor. No, or a lot of times, Joe, a lot of these will be syndicated transactions. Right, there'll be multiple lenders. Maybe give us a little flavor of just juggling juggling that between the different stakeholders uh, from the financing from a financing perspective, and how do you graduate to a level? Where, where you know you may have a little bit a little, a, a little bit more breathing room to deal with uh, when it comes to these. Uh, these I wouldn't stakers. say you really have a whole lot of breathing room with, <laughs> with any uh, any large lender. Um, yeah. Even in the, you know in a syndicated type of credit, you really have you know kind of an administrative agent who's running the deal and you know that you are reporting to, and then they're disseminating information out to all the different banks that are in that facility. So it's not like you've got, if you have seven banks in your deal, you're not having seven different conversations every month. You're disseminating information to one, you're sharing compliance information with one, they're getting that out to the syndicate. Um, obviously, if there are challenges there, then you're gonna have things to answer for and covenants that you have to uh, potentially modify along the way. But usually the, the benefit of a syndicated facility is you're really just dealing with one lender along the way. So. Got it. Cool. Um, so, you know, some of our viewers are investors, some of our viewers are operators that are looking for the next business opportunity to start. And um, if you think about the Texas economy, Houston, let's just use Houston as an example. We're thinking beyond Houston here in this question, but there are a lot of service providers that cater to the refineries, the chemical plants, call it the downstream complex. You obviously have a lot of service providers on the upstream side too. And I view this data center world as this new asset class that's coming up, which are gonna have these upstream, midstream, downstream types of uh, characteristics as well. So what we're curious to learn are, what are some of the peripheral opportunities that are gonna come about from this evolution of the data center asset class? You wanna go first? Yeah. <clears throat> If you don't want to go straight into the data center side, um, which has got its own risk and, and, and rewards, um, there are data centers are living, breathing animals. Okay, and they are constantly needing maintenance. Um, if a data center goes down, it is a very bad day for well, hands on deck. Yeah, this is not like oh, I'm so sorry about this. You're canceling at a minimum that month of revenue, which depending on the size of the data center, it could be in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Um, and uh, and that's assuming that you don't have a, a magnificent seven that is 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 holding you even closer to the fire. Um, so that could be a bullet. That could be a silver bullet on you. Um, and which is why these make news when they go down. But there's a whole group of services that are always in support. Um, and up to now, they've been in kind of disarray. They've been trying to for example, uh, electricians and, 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 and um, HVAC systems, they just kind of went from the commercial world into the data center world, and it's a completely different beast. Those that actually want to start trading these services as very data center focused, okay, while you can still maintain the stuff that you're doing in the commercial side, even the residential side, but if you've got the ability to start understanding how to keep a group of people on 24 by seven notice. Because by, by the way, if I get that call and it's happening at 3 a.m. in the morning, okay, you need someone there extremely quickly and you will pay a lot. These are annual contracts just to keep a guy ready to go, okay? It sounds unexciting, but you'd be amazed at how many people are not doing this. this but there's something that happens. These electrical firms, they grow. And when they grow, their services get too expensive. Why? because they're keeping all these resources on the bench, okay? Designing your, your teams so that they're constantly moving, you're getting revenue for those people. And you can do that by just 
mapping out how you're servicing people. And this happens all the time in telecom. These, these blueprints are all over the place. So mechanical and electrical, these, these need to be a lot more efficient. These guys tend to get pulled into big jobs. All of a sudden, you will have like a $100 million electrical firm. Believe it or not, they're going to be that large. In two years, they're a billion dollar. And at that point, I mean, when's the last time you heard of Bechtel? Okay, I mean, it's, it's, they, they just they get too large. So being nimble is going to, you're going to make a high margin on those services. Brand new to the industry, and I, I'm joking about it, um, does not sound exciting. Okay, but if you can do it, you'll be the first one in a plumbing company. Okay, we've never had water in a data center. What happens with electricity and water? Okay, now everyone will tell you, we've got these high tech, every, high tech breaks all the time. So how do you fix this? How do you solve this? More importantly, what insurance do you put in this? So if you're running this type of company, you're going to these big firms saying, I'm going to make sure you can't stop the downtime, but you can stop things from blowing up. Okay. And that's exactly what they're worried about. So that there's all these new industries that are starting to come around that are the critical services industry. Yeah. And one, you know, I'll, I'll also talk a little bit about, you know, kind of in the dark points ecosystem. One of the things that we learned early on is if we're going to be successful, we have to figure out how other people around us can make money yes. by us being in the environment, right? We had to figure out, and we're not just talking about the customer. Obviously, I have to keep the customer happy, but we figured out if we're going to be inside a living, breathing building, we had to figure out how to work with real estate owners, mm -hmm. right? We had to figure out a model that made the real estate owners happy and someone that could support us in our sales efforts with customers. And so one of the things that we learned along the way is that when a data center is in a building, this is when we were heavily pursuing our in-building model, it was a very valuable amenity to the real estate owner. It created a very sticky tenant-client relationship or tenant-landlord relationship where if the tenant has signed a lease, obviously they're in for the term of that lease, but if they also have their data center in the building, then they're going to be that much less likely to leave and go somewhere else. That was a kind of a big aha that we had with one of our customers. Once they made the commitment to use our data center, they went back to the landlord and said, you know what, we want to extend our lease because we want to make sure we can continue to have access to it. They were spending a lot more with us to use our data center than they were spending to rent, what, two, three floors yeah. from the entire building. And so that landlord, that aha for us was a really key moment in figuring out what's the value to the landlord. And we were able to spend a lot of time with asset managers, with property owners, with leasing firms to basically help them understand, hey, if this data center does well, you do better as a landlord. You have a better opportunity to fill up your buildings. I don't know what the stabilized rent or stabilized occupancy is here in Houston. In Dallas at the time, it was about 60%. Dallas buildings were, and it's probably worse now with COVID, everything after, mm -hmm. in the aftermath of COVID. But Landlords saw this as a huge competitive advantage. So that's one thing is we is we made sure that the landlords were incentivized and on board. And then you mentioned financing earlier. One of the other um, aha moments we had, one of the challenges with building a data center from scratch is obviously it's a very capital intensive business. And if we're going to raise the amount of money we need to build and operate data centers, that's great. The challenge is, as owners, we get very heavily diluted by that. So we need to figure out a way, how do we minimize the amount of capital that we have to hunt, the ownership we have to give up on our cap table while still financing our business? And that was one of the things where we went, we said, ah, we've got two threads here. We've got the owner. We know what their vested interest is. We also know what our motivation is. But if we combine the two, we actually created a unique mechanism where the landlords could co-invest in the data center, they could own an economic interest in the, in the data center that was on their site, would minimize the amount of capital we need to raise on our own cap table, while still giving us the capital we needed to build a data center. And by the way, we've got a partner with a very, very vested interest now in helping us to be successful on site. So if you think about kind of trends, and I think that's kind of, in, I think that's incumbent upon all startups is to understand their ecosystem figure out who else can make money if you do well, and try and find a way to draw them in. That's a key thing that we did at Dark Points. And I think that'd be a key thing to, to think about in getting into data centers going forward. Yeah, ecosystem is very important. Yeah. Very insightful. Mm -hmm. I always have a section for advice mm -hmm. 
for sometimes for students, sometimes for 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 uh, entrepreneurs and investors. So today I'm going to ask you a question about advice for entrepreneurs to you mm -hmm. and advice for uh, investors to you. But the question is similarly very similar. I'm going to give, let's say, if I invested fifty million dollars, and I said, Jeff, you know, where do you see the best use of this fifty million dollars? Um, in the data center world, mm -hmm. you have to pick one industry or one particular uh, uh, business model. And you have to pick a different one. As a founder, mm -hmm. same question: fifty okay. million dollars, you have just got injected, and you're gonna go start a business. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start? When well, who wants to start? Oh, I didn't start. All right. <laughs> so the question is, where I would place money today to start up a company? If you have fifty million dollars, somebody let's say I invested. I don't have $50 million, but let's say I had it, mm -hmm. and I said, you, here's $50 million, go start something in the data center world. Mm -hmm. What would you start with that $50 million in a business? So it's, um, there's, been, there's been a lot of change in the industry as, as, as in any industry, and briefly talked about <clears throat> AI, and, and AI has had a profound effect on data centers. Um, still and extremely bullish on dark points. We were very early, we could see kind of what was happening. Um, and when you take a look at the data centers as a whole are not able to get done everything that they need to get done unless they continue to evolve. Um, data has always been distributed um, and there's always a refresh cycle every five to seven years, okay? This industry, the data centers, we're just about to go into a refresh cycle where we're going to take things from centralization and let's go hyper distributed when AI showed up and then had everybody go back and retool their designs. Okay, because all of a sudden everything was hot, everything was denser. What do we do here? Thanks to NVIDIA. Thanks to NVIDIA and the newly minted crown princes they had, um, who, by the way, different topic, but NVIDIA put things in place that protected NVIDIA, but also put a massive timeline on these people, okay? So looking at the investment, there is a way to predict where these resources need to go, seeing where the power is starting to get limited. It's very similar, since we're in the home of it, of, of land now, okay? I've been able to identify, okay, where does this need to go now, okay? Um, and it does not need, yes, you need to understand how the forces and the powers that be are thinking about data and what they want to give to you next. Um, but it's very basic, okay? And we used an analogy, and it's it, with Ray Kroc, what made McDonald's was not the hamburger, it was the, it, the Eisenhower Highway Build Project. That's what made McDonald's McDonald's, okay? We are at that point in this industry and going out and trying to, for example, I also go buy up all the real estate I possibly could right now, okay? It would literally be every highway exchange on this planet. North, east, south, and west. Okay, get myself within 200 yards, okay, of each one of those turns, okay. Cellulars, I've already done it, okay. But think of what's gonna happen in 10 years with the automotive telemetry systems, okay. And that's, does it, the, 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 the Four leaf clovers on those highways are not any more special than the actual highway stretch. What I'm just saying is, you want a place that you know for sure there will be cars and problems, it's right there. So, the point what I'm saying is, those applications that are ultimately going to drive the car insurance business, everything, are going to be at every single one of these junction points. And whether I wouldn't say necessarily go into the data center world, okay, but just securing the land, making sure the power's there, making sure you've got upwards to a megawatt ready to go, okay, which it's there and it's and pretty kind of get it prepared, get it mapped out, and then have the story to show to the magnificent seven. Okay, this is what you can do in five years' time, this is what you can do in seven years' time. Because we're not in the data business, we're actually in the data logistics business. That is what we do. How do you get your computer over there to reach the customer that's over there? So that's what I would be focused on. Okay, Jeff, where would you invest in 50 million? I'd take my 50 and give it to <laughs> <laughs> No. That was not part of the <laughs> that, that doesn't. That's not allowed, no. 
Um, you know, I, I, I tend to come, like I said, from a, a lot of a real estate background. So I like to think in terms of real estate. I look at real estate over the years and I, you know, coming up, you know, when I was earlier in my career and, and spending a lot of time in that business, the investors we would meet, they all made their money by these massive shifts in the industry. A lot of these guys made their money in the RTC. Everybody remember RTC, Resolution Trust Corp, back in the early 90s after the savings and loan and all this all this real estate was uh, was was basically sold pennies on the dollar. That's where a lot of guys made their money. Um, you know, so I would look I would look to real estate. We've had a major event in real estate over the last several years. Some had just stick a little bit. COVID, right? Obviously, obviously it's right. massively impacted office. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it as it relates to data center, but I would figure out how to repurpose a lot of real estate. Not all of it necessarily, but parts of it. As we went through countless real estate properties, we saw tons of opportunity, tons of inefficiency. We used to go into properties and say to the owner, give us the worst piece, the worst square footage you have in your building, we want it. The square footage you can't lease to someone else, we want it, right? The square footage that's in the basement or tucked behind an elevator, right? An elevator closet, that's what we want for the data center. Um, I would find that type of space in commercial real estate and figure out a way to repurpose it for data center. That could be in commercial office buildings. There's tons of space here. That could be in industrial properties. A lot of people have bought industrial properties over the last several years. I guarantee there's space that could be properly configured and reutilized in a way that they could, they could ultimately end up making more money on the entire property off of that back 10% yeah. of their space. Just knowing what we know and seeing what we've seen. Um, and that's a lot of what we did at Dark Points. We found ways to make things more efficient. We found ways to live off of resources that were already there and that someone else had already paid for. That's how I would, that's what I would go after and I'd build a data element into it. Cool. So, we'll see. Jeff, thank you. Thank you so much for doing Appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank me. you so much for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Folks, please give them a round of applause. Thank you.